Bonjour et bienvenue à tout le monde. Nous sommes ravis d'accueillir pour cette dernière session de la Good Week et en exclusivité française avant Amsterdam, Beth Cantor depuis la Californie et Alison Fine en direct de New York. Alors, Beth et Alison ont produit un remarquable rapport sur l'intelligence artificielle et la générosité qu'elles vont vous présenter aujourd'hui. Je vous invite à poser vos questions en anglais de manière à ce que le dialogue soit le plus fluide possible. So Beth, Alison, we're delighted to welcome you to this last session of the Good Week. Uh, I leave you the floor to present your paper, but we'll be here if needed. I'll cut my mic and camera, but all you need is, uh, if you have uh, this technical difficulties, is to say it, and Natasha, Judith, or I will be here. Great. Have a Thank nice you. session. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Beth Cantor, and I am. Uh, uh, I work in the nonprofit sector. I've been uh, in the nonprofit sector a long time, working at sort of the uh, the, the, the uh, intersection of emerging technology and um, nonprofits and social change. And um, and I have uh, authored a book called The Network Nonprofit with my Uh, co-author and colleague, longtime colleague, uh, Alison Fine. Would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. Thank you, Beth. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, like you, I have spent my entire career working uh, with NGOs and at the intersection of technology and social change. And we're just delighted to be here today to provide an overview of a report we just released last month, funded by the Gates Foundation, on um, how to use artificial intelligence to increase giving uh, to causes. Terrific. So what we're going to uh, share with you today um, are some top level findings from the report. Um, the report is pretty comprehensive and we uh, encourage you to download a copy. It is in English. Um, it's at AI for the number four giving.org. But what we're going to uh, cover today, uh, we're going to give you the high level information about what fundraisers need to know about artificial intelligence. We'll talk a little bit about the challenges to adoption and we'll give you some starting steps and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So, <laughs> so uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, artificial intelligence and um, And actually, you have probably are already interacting with artificial intelligence, um, but the, but it's hidden. Um, if you use something like Netflix or Amazon, uh, artificial intelligence is working in the background to uh, analyze a lot of data about uh, your purchases or what you've been watching, as well as other people like you, and present to you some options that you will most likely like. Um, and uh, we're in a really important um, inflection point around artificial intelligence. And I know Allison always loves to describe exactly where we are, if you'd like to do that. So oftentimes, Beth, uh, when people are drawing the, a graph of technology adoption, it looks like an ice hockey stick. And it has the blade of the stick, and then it goes up very, very sharply. And we're right at the heel, at that inflection point of mass adoption of AI because the computing power has uh, increased in power, but decreased in cost. So now we have a whole host of products that regular people like you and I and smaller NGOs and organizations can use every day. And that's why this is such an exciting moment in time. Yeah, it reminds us um, what it was like over 10, 12 years ago at the very beginning of social media, um, or just at that That's point exactly with artificial right. intelligence. So <clears throat> uh, we always like to start with a really simple definition of like what is artificial intelligence? And it is um, basically the ability for the computer to do tasks that used to be only reserved for humans. Um, and The task that uh, artificial intelligence and the various different flavors and types of artificial intelligence can excel at is pattern matching. So, um, so if any of you have children, and um, and I'm sure you do this in France, I'm sure it's done all over the world. Um, in the U.S., we have um, flashcards, and there would be a picture of like a cat, 
and you would point to um, uh, the cat and you would say cat, or I think it's la chat in um, uh, French. I won't dare speak my poor French, but you point to it and say cat and your child says cat. And then they learn to recognize and associate the word cat with, with a cat. So, th um, so that is the intelligent uh, behavior that um, art artificial intelligence facilitates in computers, pattern matching. So um, in order to really use it effectively, you need four things. You need a strategic purpose or a, a question you need answered. You need data and lots of it. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about that um, in more depth a little bit on later on. You need algorithms, and that's just a fancy word for a mathematical equation, like two plus two equals four, and so on. And then the tools, um, computers, uh, uh, mobile phones, um, satellite imaging, cameras, there's a wide variety of tools. And <clears throat> there's a reason there's a cat, a picture of a cat on that slide. Um, we always like to tell the story of, um, to explain how artificial intelligence works. A engineer at Amazon who, who knew how to code in artificial intelligence had a problem with his cat. The cat would bring in dead mice and dead birds and just come through the cat door and drop them in his living room. And he wanted to solve um, this problem, his strategic purpose. How can I stop the cat from bringing dead mice or dead birds into my house? So then he got some tools. He uh, automated the cat door um, so that so uh, it could uh, automatically open and close. And he got an artificial intelligence enabled camera. Um, and then he started collecting data. That's the other ingredient. And he got thousands of pictures of the cat. And then he described those pictures as either the cat approaching the house without a bird or rat in its mouth, uh, the cat approaching uh, the house with, with um, a bird or uh, a rat in its mouth, and the cat leaving the house. So that was the data. He labeled the data. And then the last thing he added to it was the algorithm or the mathematical equation, which was something like, if the cat <laughs> is approaching the, hat, uh, the house with a rat or uh, a bird in its mouth, clo automatically close the trap door and send me a text message to wake me up and also and send a automated contribution to the Audubon Society because my cat probably just killed another bird. So, <laughs> so that's just a, a really simple explanation of um, artificial intelligence and how it works. So there is an existing field of practice that's been going on for several years now called AI for Good. And it's a field that is the combination of very large tech firms, as you see on the left-hand side of the slide here, a, a firm like Intel or Microsoft, and NGOs working in areas like healthcare or um, with refugees. And these two um, types of organizations have been coming together for the last several years to try to take uh, the technology of AI used in the corporate sector and bring it to bear on very significant um, large problems. Um, a problem, so we'll see what that a problem could be. We have an example. Great. So um, let me show you the example. Um, yes, <laughs> this comes from um, USA uh, for, for Refugees. Um, and they did a project, which was a collaboration with a satellite company that was providing satellite images and um, Stanford University's AI lab. Um, and so the problem, the problem was that they have overcrowding in their refugee camps. And, um, and right now, they, uh, to solve that problem, they usually send staff on site to the camp to, to map what's going on and to figure out how to redesign the camp so it's more effective, so they can deliver more services to more refugees. But obviously, that's an expensive endeavor. And right now, because of COVID, it's very difficult for them to go on site and do this. And not to mention that they have many, many, many uh, refugee camps around the world. So uh, as a pilot starting off, they uh, had satellite, satellite images and they used the AI to analyze how the, the camp services and how refugees were using the camp. 
And then the staff was able to make recommendations about um, redesigning the camp. So this saved a lot of time. It, it created um, health and safety uh, precautions. And now um, uh, with this technique in hand, they, are, they could scale this process and be able to make um, many more of their refugee camps uh, more effective without risking the health of their staff. And I, as I might add, reduce a lot of cost in travel and staffing time. Yeah. And Beth, just to remind folks what you were talking about just a few minutes ago, which is that AI is a very big field and it has lots and lots of applications out in the real world. And you just gave that marvelous example of using AI to track um, where, you know, refugee housing, we are seeing it being used now to track COVID uh, around the world. We are seeing it, uh, we're seeing robots and drones providing humanitarian aid. So uh, AI is a complicated field, has lots and lots of applications. Our um, focus, particularly for today, is just to drill down on this brand new field that we're starting to create and we know we're starting to create it because we came up with the hashtag of AI forgiving, that's how new it is, of ways to use artificial intelligence to increase uh, donations mm -hmm. to NGOs and to help donors figure out where and how uh, to give their that's money. That's great. And of course, too, there's um, many different types of AI. It's not a monolith. Um, it's kind of like, um, uh, doctors, you know, we have doctors who are generalists, we call them general practitioners, but yet we have a whole array of specialists, you know, doctors that do brain surgery or deliver babies. Um, so it's the same thing um, with uh, artificial intelligence. Um, there's many, many different subfields. Um, for example, there is um, a computer to voice, uh, which covers things like Siri. There are there's um, text to uh, uh, computer interfaces, which are uh, includes chatbots, um, and many many different flavors. The one the example I just showed you um, is a form of AI that is just using images or, or photographs or satellite images. Um, so it comes in many different flavors, and um, I'm going to show you a couple examples um, of how it's specifically using used for giving. So the first one we want to show you. And there's a number of applications of uh, software tools already on the market um, that um, are, are, are essentially um, AI driven donor databases. OK, and so what uh, these tools are able to do are they're able to use the algorithm uh, to, to analyze data around your donors and uh, be able to do a number of things like pull back a list of these are the most likely donors who are, who are about to give. So these are the, the donors that you should focus on now and cultivate. Or alternately, they may say these donors uh, could potentially lapse. You better um, begin to engage them. And so what you see on the screen are just a couple examples of, um, of, of, of tools that are out there. One is called uh, Gravity First Draft that not only does the analysis through your donor base, but it can also come back and make suggestions um, on uh, the style in which you should communicate with that donor, not only the style, you know, whether it's a more friendly tone or whether it's a more formal tone, but also um, things that you should bring up in your messaging. Now, it doesn't actually, uh, the, the major gift uh, officer is not just sitting in their desk saying, oh, push a button and my job is done and the algorithm is going out and taking the donor to lunch. Um, but it's it's doing that first draft as the name of the, the software indicates. So it's doing a lot of the, the work that could take up to hours and hours a week. If, if any of you are major gift officers, you know, doing that research can be just the human doing it can be really labor intensive, but the algorithm yeah. can do it really quickly. Well, and, and to uh, build on that point, Beth, you and I have always been very, very clear with, with folks that technology is not intended to replace people. It's to augment and help um, people to work uh, more effectively uh, in their jobs, right? So you can have the you know first draft really going through an enormous amount of data much more efficiently than a person could, but only for the purpose of making sure that a person can send out a real a message that's very targeted and, very and what this timely. does, um, Alice and I just learned a new word. 
AI gives a dividend. This is the AI dividend. It's yes. it's it's the freed AI up dividend. that um, major gift officer's time to really focus on the human aspect of interacting with the donor and building that relationship. Um, often that you know, uh, sometimes we don't have enough time for that. And that is so important in um, increasing retention rates and keeping our donors. So our next sample, example, AI um, can also be used in online fundraising. And, um, and what it can do, I like to describe it, it can create and help you develop communication to your smaller donors, those 25 euro donors or so, um, uh, and treat them as if they are the major donors by able to by being able to personalize the communication at scale. It's not just sending 10,000 people the same email message. It's being able to send 10,000 different variations um, uh, that are customized to 10,000 different people, which in, a, in effect uh, is speaking directly to that donor and is going to increase conversion rates. And we've seen that. Um, these tools also do other things, um, like, for example, they can suggest, based on the data, um, uh, different uh, um, email subject lines in the subject area. Not just do your A-B test, like, you know, you've come up with two different subject um, lines for your email, and you get the data back, and you know that this one worked better. What it can do is actually do an analysis um, based on uh, donor information and give you a list of 20 different subject lines to test and then rank them. So again, all of this can make your online fundraising campaigns uh, far more uh, effective and increase the uh, conversion rate. <clears throat> um, uh, also, um, uh, AI, is also uh, sort of lay, lies beneath what is called chatbots. And so <clears throat> we love chatbots. Chat <laughs> and of course, many of you are uh, probably very familiar with chatbots. I mean, um, I know I just went and bought a pair of shoes last night <laughs> on the internet. And of course, there was a chatbot to help me figure out my um, purchase. And uh, Facebook has really popularized and um, uh, chatbots through the messenger uh, chatbot. So you may already have a chatbot on your Facebook page. But in this example, it comes from um, uh, the Children's Hospital Network in the US and Canada. And every year they do an online gaming benefit fundraiser. And they get a lot of donors who are from the US and also from Canada. But there's a lot of information to wade through on their website. And so their chatbot um, is sort of like a concierge. Um, you can ask, ask a question and it will direct you right to that spot. Now, um, the staff used to get tons of questions from online potential donors coming from Canada and would ask, you know, what does the, you know, what does the Canadian dollar uh, translate to convert to for US dollars? I'd like to know before, you know, I make my donation. And they were repeatedly answering these questions, but, um, and, or sometimes a question would come in in the middle of the night and they would have to wait until the next morning to answer it and maybe lose that donor. So the chatbots are there 24 seven, they don't sleep. <laughs> Humans need sleep, chatbots don't. And the chatbot can not, if somebody, a donor says, uh, asks a question like, what is my um, uh, Canadian dollar donation? Um, how, how does that translate? That the uh, chatbot will answer it, but then it'll serve up a link to a landing page where it already has the uh, donation amounts in Canadian dollars. So, um, so this level of service to donors and being able to answer their questions while staff is doing other higher level things or things like sleeping, um, again, helps the um, conversion rate as well. You're not losing uh, these donors because they're not getting the answers to their questions. Over to you, Allison. <laughs> oh, I was waiting for the oh. slide. Um, there we go. Um, so we've talked about uh, nonprofits, NGOs raising money. The flip side of that coin is that AI is also being used to help donors find causes. And here's a product uh, that Salesforce has created called Philanthropy Cloud, used largely in the US by United Ways, and they're going to be expanding. And the idea here is 
you can have a, a whole bunch of criteria that donors can say they're interested in. It might be geography, an issue area, the size of the organization. And um, uh, Philanthropy Cloud can then match up that donor's interests with a cause. And the promise here that's different uh, is a few things. Number one, we can ensure that every single donor gets that kind of concierge personal touch in um, uh, finding causes that meet their needs that right now only very high level donors get. It can help smaller causes be lifted up out of the pack to meet somebody's need and it can continue to enhance the engagement between those donors uh, and those causes. We see this as a really wonderful opportunity to democratize uh, philanthropy and allow donors to have a much more interesting, much more personal experience than, than they generally have had. And, in and an example of how this works, and um, this is being used to um, in, in workplaces, um, uh, workplace giving so that a company can decide yeah. that as part of their CSR, they want to make sure that their employees are volunteering or donating to different causes. And um, and the way that the AI makes this efficient is that um, they've collected information about the employees' preferences, um, you know, uh, what types of activities they're interested in, as well as they know where the employee lives and that sort of thing. So when an employee uh, logs onto the system, you know, looking for an opportunity, they're, they are only shown things that they're interested in. So one example I'd love to tell is um, the employee who is only interested in, in volunteering by walking dogs <laughs> at the local animal rescue. So the AI knows when this person logs on that they're only going to show them opportunities of, to volunteer in an animal rescue, but that are near uh, where the employee lives or where the employee works. And then it can also serve up other information like public transportation to get to and from the, um, the animal rescue. And it goes a little bit further than just matching. It's also engaging with the employee. So um, they know, it knows when the employee is going to go volunteer. And maybe after uh, the employee has walked the dogs at the rescue, uh, the, the employee may receive a follow-up email or text message that said, how was your experience on a scale of one to five, with five being amazing and one being not so good. And if um, the employee consistently ranks it amazing, they might then follow up with a, you know, a request for donation. If they ranked it not so good, they would send feedback to the NGO about uh, this, this volunteer did not have a really good experience and take a look at how, it, how to improve it. Um. Oh, this is some of my favorite area, um, and it's very emerging. It's very much developing, and it's voice-activated fundraising. Um, many of you probably are using a Siri or, um, or Amazon Alexa um, uh, smart speakers, and that um, AI drives that. It's the same sort of um, uh, coding and technology that drives chatbots, but instead of communicating in text, you're, they're communicating in voice. So voice activated fundraising is in the very, very, very early experimental uh, stages. Uh, in the US, Amazon is testing um, uh, this option with a, a smaller, smallish group of uh, nonprofits where um, you know, Alexa will suggest different charities that, they, um, uh, that, that somebody should donate to. Uh, one recent campaign that was fairly successful was with an organization that um, uh, that uh, donates school supplies to children in disadvantaged neighborhoods. And so uh, if a family was going online and using their Alexa to purchase the backpack and back to school supplies for their child, Alexa might say, would you like to also donate, you know, $25 to this campaign and also uh, 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 that would purchase a backpack for, for this child. Um, so this is very much um, in the early stages now, and we expect uh, with the more widespread adoption of smart speakers and the kind of um, development of this field of fundraising that it's going to be more common in the future. Which we're going to talk about now, the future. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, so... Um, here, here we are, we're just at that heel of the hockey stick, as I was saying. And as we're beginning to see all of this practice 
um, with AI, we're also beginning to see opportunities. What you called uh, the AI dividend uh, a few minutes ago of ways that using the technology can actually free up time to do different things. So this is the first opportunity is pivoting from this frantic race to keep uh, donors uh, coming in the system, but then they don't stay. And we know in the US, Beth, that the retention rate for donors is just dreadful. Um, it's, it's, it's less than a quarter. <laughs> As you like to say. <laughs> cancers in the second year, and then, you know, just 40% each year after that. Um, if the technology can be used well, um, we can free up time to actually focus on relationship building, which is the next um, slide here. So we really think there's an opportunity for fundraisers to carve out time, actually calendar it, put it on their calendar for spending time with donors because there's too much unidirectional communications coming from NGOs out to people. And generally, the topic of those communications you and I know so well is give us money, give us money, give us money. And people out there uh, feel like they're just machines, uh, cash machines, um, that they're just supposed to give money. What would happen if those fundraisers took a quarter or one third of their time and just spent it listening to people? Tell us why this cause is important to you. Tell us when and how we make you feel important, like we make you feel known here. That is such a powerful driver for people. Um, and we think that AI, almost ironically, it's, it's almost counterintuitive, has the capability of making fundraising more, not less human uh, in the future. Right. Um, uh, but, <laughs> and we're going to get to this in a moment, that the, uh, the robots aren't going to get on the phone with your donor. And we'll talk about this in a moment. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't want any robots on um, the phone. Yeah. So we also think that uh, AI can really help increase giving in the future. Um, and we, there seems to be a combination of three things that can come together to help increase giving, particularly of small, smaller donors. So three possible scenarios could be real-time funding for emergency needs. And we know when an emergency happens, I mean, right now there's a hurricane bearing down on the U.S. Uh, there's, you know, it's a lot of chaos and a lot of information. And it's, you know, difficult to figure out where the need is and people want to help. Um, algorithms could, and uh, combined with some dashboards, could really help make that type of fundraising uh, a lot more efficient and effective and get more people to uh, donate. We're also thinking about uh, sort of uh, something like a, a Yelp for Causes, uh, where people can, um, you know, immediately connect with causes that uh, they're uh, interested in, and then also lifestyle uh, dashboards, similar to what we just described uh, with the United Way and Workplace Giving. So, so this is the future. I mean, oh, how many years ahead are we saying? What do you think? <laughs> so it's coming fast, but um, look, I think I think we're talking single digit years. You know, we're talking within the next five years. All of this really going up to scale. This isn't twenty years in the future. Uh, the robots are here. They look a little bit different. They might look like your iPhone <laughs> instead of looking like a humanoid kind of robot, but it is a robot. And um, one of the reasons why we want to do this work right now is to help NGOs be proactive about using the technology and not just let it come at us. And also like at this point of time, so you know, that we're in with COVID, I really think it can help with the rebounding. Um, and uh, especially when uh, budgets begin to be tight, there's the efficiency gains and just this need yeah. to... Um, really connect with more humans as we, be, as we become a longer time in isolation. So let's talk about the challenges, Allison. Yeah, and there's a question uh, below here, somebody asking about who owns the data. So look, data is gonna be a huge challenge here. Number one, we don't have enough clean data of about our constituents and our donors and we certainly don't have enough data around the impact and outcomes of um, NGO efforts. 
So we need a huge amount of data and it has to be clean. Uh, we need, and we need to talk about who owns it. The uh, European Union has done a much better job of making sure that users um, own their data in a way that we haven't in the US. Nonetheless, what we are seeing now is that for medium and small size organizations, we're going to need commercial platforms like some of the companies we talked about at the beginning of this presentation, like an AI quilt. And we just went through with social media what happens when those companies are black boxes, they're not transparent, you can't see into them, and they own all of the data. We would like this to be more of an equal partnership between NGOs and commercial platforms. NGOs are gonna to have to create a new staff position of data scientists, and that's gonna be difficult uh, given how tight we know budgets are. Um, but we have to know how to use data better uh, in a way that we never have as a sector. Um, and then finally, every single organization is going to have to take the ethical use of AI and robots seriously in a way that we've never done before, but nobody's done before. We are just creating this field. We recommend that every organization has an outside AI ethics committee. Uh, doesn't have to just be techies, can be people who think about the ethical and, use and, and of, users. <laughs> of data. And users, one of the issues that's going to come up, Beth, and we're starting to see this, is that social service providers are beginning to use chatbots and other AI screening tools for people to get services. And the question is, is the code that's um, making that those decisions to screen people for housing or for food, uh, is there bias built into the code? Is there racial bias? Is there gender bias built into that? And these are the new questions that even, organizations um, need to consider. A, a really interesting use case that we just heard about the other day, um, uh, met many organizations do uh, acquire third party um, uh, databases. And I'm sure it's happening in Europe as well, where there's agreements to be able to append additional data to your um, uh, organization's fundraising, uh, fundraising uh, donor data that gives you additional information. And um, uh, one uh, story we heard was that uh, one vendor has uh, fields that identify gender uh, and race, but, but they're not very transparent about how those labels came about. And, um, but staff internally are, um, are, uh, are making decisions around how to communicate with their donors based on those labels. And what, what if it's incorrect? Um, and that, you know, just think about it. If, um, if there's a name that sounds like it should be a, a woman, but it's a male and the, um, and the communication is dear mister, um, it could be insulting. So, so lots of, lots of things to unpack for organizations around ethical standards and uh, these other things that we brought up. So getting started, <laughs> what are the steps? Um, we were just saying the other day that, um, that every time that you know, there's a new, quote, disruptive technology on the horizon, that we always want to like, have some really thoughtful initial steps so we don't get trapped by what we call uh, shiny object syndrome. We start to think, oh, this technology is so cool. Let's use it. But you really need to um, have some thoughtful steps. So first, you know, having a real strategic purpose. Uh, why are you using this? Is it the best tool? Um, Always pressure test your ideas with experts. Um, there's also the mind shift uh, from transactional to relational. Um, you know, how are you gonna use that AI dividend um, to really improve your relationships with donors? Um, the data, um, do you have access to usable, clean, complete, relevant data? Um, also expertise, um, not all of us, not all nonprofits have a uh, in-house data scientist who can at least evaluate some of the products, but I think it behooves us to become educated consumers and to be able to ask uh, questions about these software tools uh, that are AI driven. You know, how does the algorithm work? Where does the data come from? How was the algorithm trained? What data set? Um, all of those sorts of things. And then, um, and of course, as Allison just described, the, the plan around ethical concerns and donor privacy and data bias. Did I forget anything, Allison? 
No, those are, you know, we always recommend, uh, Beth, that people think about inching their way into um, an area like this with a discrete experiment. What could you do in the next six months, maybe taking one of the technologies that we highlighted and use with just part of your donor base and uh, give it a try for three months, reflect on what went well, what you didn't know, what surprised you, and then give it another try as well. Um, because um, this is a very different way of working. And we don't want to say, take all of this technology and turn over your entire donor base um, to it um, without giving it a try first. So I guess with that, <laughs> We will open it up for uh, Q and A questions. Um, and I believe if you um, feel that you uh, want to ask your question in French, you can do that um, and it'll be translated for us. I might even be able to slightly understand it, but I wouldn't guarantee that. Um, I had a couple years of high school French. Um, so any questions? or experiences. Um, maybe some of you are already using some AI tools in fundraising and would like to share some of your experience. You know, we should probably talk a little bit about the cost of some of these software oh, packages. Oh, yes. What would be the, oh, yes, well, definitely a chatbot. Um, yeah. actually, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> that's, um, that's exactly right. No, uh, because the reason why chatbots have proliferated so much, they've grown so much over the past couple of years, is because they are so inexpensive and have become so easy. Uh, to use for organizations, um, particularly on Facebook. And yes, and, it, and I think the thing that you want to test um, with a chatbot is um, uh, even before you build the chatbot, um, you want to probably have a lot of information and maybe conversations with people who are most likely to use that chatbot, donors, the, and understand exactly what kinds of questions they um, may be asking um, and, uh, you know, finding out um, things like, you know, what are the repeated questions that we're getting that staff has to answer all the time? And a, a chatbot can be on your website. It could also be, you know, on, on Facebook. Um, but that's the first thing you want to, first of all, know, like, what are the things that people, donors ask all the time? And you also want to test how, that information is communicated, you know, the voice that, that the chatbot is using. Because um, it, it's very much like when we think about like branding exercises for organization, what is, you know, what's the style, what's the persona, uh, what, what's the way that uh, it, uh, that chatbot can, can communicate in text. I mean, we, there's a whole different approaches. There are chatbots that are very business oriented and they give choices and they're very informative. And there are other chatbots that are more, more around for engagement and they make it a fun experience. Um, I'm thinking of uh, the one that the, uh, the Pope's yeah. American mission uses for fundraising. It, it, has, it, has, it has the personality of the Pope. Um, you can pray with this chatbot. <laughs> um, you can hear about um, the types of work they're doing and, um, and be, you, know, you can opt into different yeah. things. So um, I was going to just say that it's uh, it's not a uh, it's not like a pot roast that you put it in the oven and it's done. It's something that you really it, it's uh, it requires some iteration and learning. Well, I was just going to say that the good news is you can continue to uh, improve the questions and answers over time, um, and in addition. Beth, we've heard people say, well, we've got frequently asked questions on our website. Do we need that? Um, and the answer is, if you can, if you have the bandwidth to, to create a chatbot, 
Uh, it's a wonderful addition to frequently asked questions because a lot of people are just not going to read your website and they really want to just start typing in a question. Uh, and it, it has an immediacy. And, and I, I might also add uh, um, to it as we're like waiting for more questions to come in about um, chatbots that there's the easy technology <laughs> like uh, Messenger and um, which is really easy to configure. And the way it works is you, you anticipate all the questions and you write all the answers. And when somebody types in a question, it serves up an answer that you've already thought about. There's a other type of chatbot. Um, it's called an intelligent agent. And it's a more sophisticated type of um, uh, artificial intelligence. It does require a little bit additional skills uh, where the chatbot actually learns from interacting with people. And an example I'd like to give is United Way in the US for their disaster information. They, uh, for, for Louisiana, which is often hit with hurricanes, um, uh, they had a chatbot, her name was Carla. <laughs> um, it stood for something, emergency something or other. And when they tested her, um, uh, they had only presumed that people would be asking her questions in English but there is a, a, a big uh, uh, French-speaking population in Louisiana, um, a Creole and uh, so forth. And those people were asking questions in their native language. And so Carla had to then learn that language to be able to translate the questions. So lots of interesting uses. There's a question about ROI, uh, Beth, and we should talk about the um, case study we just saw from the Rainforest um, Action Network. Uh, we're very, very focused right now on this issue of donor retention, that it, it costs so much money to acquire a new donor, and then to just lose them very quickly is an enormous waste of money. We call this the leaky bucket um, process of all these donors coming in and then leaking out very, very quickly. Um, and we just saw this case study with the um, Rainforest um, Action Network using, I can't remember the platform they were using. LT. Do you remember the accessible intelligence? And they increased their donor retention by something like yes. 600%. Wait, wait, let's put a pin um, in that. Year to year. 600%. That's um, Alex is not speaking. 600%, not 6%, 600%. By having the cause reach out immediately and start a conversation with donors, because we all know that experience of maybe, maybe you get a, a, a thank you for uh, your donation, and then you're just in the regular mill of email outreach after that. There's nothing personal after that. And this tool is making sure that all of the communications after that first thank you, uh, including that first thank you, feel very personal, feel very timely, and it's a really engaging donors in a very different way uh, with that organization. And again, with that AI dividend, um, imagine the staff is also spending more time, I hope the staff is spending more time with these donors. So there is the potential for enormous shifts in donor retention when we start to use <laughs> these tools well. However, <laughs> There's also the possibility that people just start twirling out emails faster and faster um, and use these tools very badly. And that would make us very, very sad. So NGO people, please don't make us sad. Please use these tools well. All right. Let's see some of the other questions here. And so um, we want to say to Matilda, no, robots cannot and should not replace people. Robots can analyze an enormous amount of data. They can do some of the regular tasks uh, very well, like sorting data or finding um, donors who haven't given in a while. But that interaction with a donor, we think needs to be reserved for human beings we no. do not and ever want to so see think robots of it as on uh, each one doing what they do best right so the robots are good at all of those anal analyzing the data and doing things where humans may tire but a robot is not the one <laughs> that can be human with your donor we, we 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 use the term augmentation not replacement 
Yeah. Let's see. Okay, I see. I see one example of um, uh, I think uh, where a chatbot didn't give the right information or right answer to the uh, question. And to me, that's that sounds like a, a poorly designed <laughs> chatbot. Um, where uh, and I think the poorly yeah. designed ones are where people don't anticipate what potential questions may come up and haven't programmed in the answers or or aren't using the type of uh, technology where the the chatbot can learn, or having a system where the, if they're um, if the the question can't be answered by the chatbot, to notify the human <laughs> to then get in touch with um, uh, the individual, and that happens quite a bit with um, when they've been deployed for disaster uh, information because people need timely information or they could die, right? Or if they get the wrong information. So I know a, a number of the uh, the chatbots and the artificial intelligence that's been used in emergency work have um, have been carefully designed so that they can bring in the human when the human is needed and understand what the rote information is that can be answered and not cause harm to people. This is also why it's important to start using AI with an, what we call an experimental mindset because it's not going to work all perfectly well from the get-go. And so you may institute um, a chatbot and somebody gets the wrong uh, answer. And too often uh, in NGO world, we're very risk averse. We get very upset if a donor is upset. It's going to happen. It is fixable. And it's important that you continue to try to use these tools and get better at them because they're not going away. Uh, they're going to be in this space um, for the future. And you don't want to just give it one try and then pull all the way back. Uh, there's another question I think is interesting. Well. Again, on chatbots, uh, where was it? According to your experience, do people feel a chatbot is like an intrusion or like a facilitator. And that's, I, again, I think that's a poorly designed chatbot. And um, as part of our work uh, over the last couple of years, I think I've spent a lot of time with chatbots. <laughs> and um, the ones that are poorly designed, it can be really annoying because um, I remember one, it just kept on saying, would you like to give me money? Would you like to donate? Would you like to donate? And I was asking you know, different questions um, or else where, um, they haven't thought they haven't tested it enough and really thought it through. And uh, the, the chatbot says, I'm sorry, I can't answer that right now. Would you like to ask another question? Uh, or when you're um, when it's designed um, and it leads you into this uh, a loop that's very annoying um, and, and, and takes you down rabbit holes. <laughs> um, so you have to really that's where the testing comes. And it really has to be you really have to use like human um, design techniques to really design it for your audience. So it is a good experience or it could backfire. Well, Beth, we wanna just thank everybody for um, spending time with us today. This is again, an emergent field. We're just beginning to understand this field, we want to invite you to come with us uh, over the next couple of years as it deepens and expands in um, experiences and tools that will be out there. You can find either one of us on Twitter. We're there a lot. Um, and um, we're just delighted. And um, we'd encourage to you to this um, conversation you know, go to the www.aiforgiving.org and please download the report and, you know, contact us, let you know what you think, share your experience with us. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Merci. Thanks, Karine. Thanks Merci. for having us. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Merci à vous. Thank you very much, Alison and Beth. It's been an honor to have you speak of uh, artificial intelligence and futurology. <laughs> Thank you. Our pleasure.
Donc, n'hésitez pas you. à envoyer vos, vos questions, contactez Beth et, et Alison par, par Twitter et surtout téléchargez leur passionnant rapport sur l'intelligence euh, artificielle. Si vous n'avez pas de questions, je vous propose un petit sondage. We're going to have a little survey for the uh, Okay. So, how, how do you say artificial intelligence in French? Oh, it's intelligence artificielle. Oh, okay. I love that. <laughs> you switch. <laughs> intelligence artificielle, exactly. <laughs> Definitely, yes. We'll You're practice welcome. that for next year when we come and visit. So I suppose with you. there's not a French word for chatbot. It's just. It's uh, no, we, we still say chatbot. Chatbot. Okay. Right. Chatbot. Right. And it's very used in uh, e commerce, more and more used in NGOs, and uh, I hope even more in, uh, in a few months and years. Voilà. <laughs> I think there are no more questions. Voilà. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh -huh. okay. You too. And well, see you. See you very soon. Stay well. Bye bye. Stay safe. bye, bye, bye. Merci à tous okay, et au revoir. Bye bye. Au revoir.